I'm not sure what you mean by fetal death. It was saying something about the fetal ducts, like the, I forgot the exact the name on, like how they close and stuff before birth. Yeah. Penis, yeah, so yeah. there are <clears throat> three valves in baby circulation that are open that shunts blood in a different route um, than it does when in post-birth circulation. Your, your, um, you, you've got your uh, foramen ovale, um, which, um, God, what am I trying to say? It, it is where your, you got the foramen ovale, the ductus arteriosus, the ductus venosus. Um, they all work together to shunt blood in a different fashion. For example, the the ductus venosus shunts blood more towards the, towards the liver first um, from the mom, um, so that it can filter the blood and process it. Um, then the two other filters are in, or not filters. I'm sorry, the d two other ducts in the heart are recirculating the blood so that it's basically bypassing the lungs because their lungs are not functional to actually cause gas exchange. So it is, um, like for instance, the, the ductus arteriosus is, um, is an opening between the pulmonary artery and the aorta that is allowing blood to go that way instead of going through the blood, uh, instead of through the blood vessels in the lungs so that when then when baby's born that duct closes so that it circulates like our blood does and goes through the um through the pulmonary system no problem the biggest thing is it, it just it changes the blood flow so that it's not getting circulated through the lungs, um, the foramen ovale and the ductus arteriosus. And then once they're born, ideally, that's supposed to shut. And when we get to pediatrics and we talk about cardiac, we'll talk about, for instance, PDAs, which is a patent ductus arteriosus, and that's where that ductus arteriosus doesn't close the way it's supposed to, so it can give them a murmur. What other questions do you have? All right, so let's see how y'all do at Jeopardy. Does somebody have a question? I just heard it. Okay. Let's see. Uh. There we go. All right, let's do the first one. And y'all can certainly use your microphones if you want. Um, this is the expected location and quality of the uterine fundus immediately after birth. Where are you going to find it, and what is it going to feel like? We can't see the slide, Miss Martinez. What? <laughs> you can't? It came on, then went off for a brief second, at least on my end. Yeah, mine too. I thought there was something wrong with my screen for a second. See, and it says it's sharing. Hold on, let me hit stop sharing. Share window.
Well, can we answer the question? Of course you can. Go for it. Is um, the one between the pubic the symphysis and the... Yeah, right in the middle between the uh, umbilicus and the pubis. Nope, not right after birth. So right after birth, it's going to be right at the umbilicus, maybe a centimeter above, and it's going to be firm. All right. So let's one, try this was again. it one hour after its uh, midline? No, it, it descends one to two centimeters every twelve to twenty-four hours. So it would take probably several days before that would get it would get to that point. All right, what do y'all see? A black screen. Damn, and then it left. I don't now understand. I think the last it. time you had that problem, too, and you just, like, went down on the slides. You didn't, like, enlarge it. Yeah, with PowerPoints, but I can't do this that this that way because it's going to show you the answers. Um, I don't, hold on, let me close the window. Um, and open it back up. Because it works. It worked before, so. All right, what do y'all see? Anybody? It says loading. Oh, I see it. Yay! It. Perfecto. So y'all see maternal newborn exam two, round one, correct? Yes. Perfect. All right, now what do you see? Do you see a blue screen with the expected location and quality of the uterine fundus? Yes, ma'am. Yay! All right, so this is the one we just answered, so let's talk about it. So you, it should be firm, and it should be at the level of the umbilicus, maybe a centimeter above, and it should be midline. So if the fundus is boggy and deviated to the side, what does that indicate? A full bladder. A full bladder. Beautiful. So if they are de the deviated to the side is the big difference. If they were boggy and midline, then you'd worry about that they need a have uterine acne and need a fundal massage. Perfect. All right. Components of the focus postpartum assessment. Do y'all remember the acronym Bubble He? What does it stand for? You mean bubble? Uh, no, I mean bubble he. Uh, breasts, um, uterus, uterus um, bowel, bladder, bladder. Uh, lochia, and um, what, episiotomy. <laughs> yep. What's the H? Um, emotion. A home and sign. Yeah, y'all knocked it out of the park. So, breast, uterus, bowel, bladder, Loki, episiotomy, Holman's, and emotional. Remember the Holman's? We don't really do Holman's sign anymore, but it helps you remember the acronym just to remind you to look for blood clots, whether it's DVTs or pulmonary embolisms. And then episiotomy, looking at the perineum, not just if they have an episiotomy or not. All right. Yeah, I hope y'all know this one. Edema and redness of the calf along with a positive home sign. What are you going to think that is? DVT. DVT. Very good. Deep vein thrombosis. How are we going to treat it? By putting those stockings on them. The nope. compressors. By the time they have a DVT, you put those stockings on them and you break off a clot and send it right to their lungs. Do you give them um the streptokinase, that kinase stuff, the clot? Not typically for a 
a DVT. Um, now, they'll, they'll use it for like stroke, like the streptokinase, they'll use it for strokes and heart attacks and things like that. But it probably would depend on the size of the DVT and what's going on, but not typically. What else could we give them? They might have heparin, heparin. maybe heparin, Lovenox. Very good. Heparin, Lovenox, or um, Xarelto is another common one that they'll use. We used to use Coumadin a lot. Um, the problem with Coumadin is there's so many restrictions related to like vitamin K, for instance, with your diet. Um, you have to get assessed frequently and get your PT and INR done. So it's not super, Coumadin's a great drug, it works well, but it's super inconvenient to take. Uh, versus Xarelto, there's no restrictions with things like diet and testing. So we're using Xarelto a lot as well. So they need some kind of anticoagulant, usually either heparin, um, anoxaparin um, is not typically used as a treatment. It's used as a preventative, um, but you will sometimes see that as a treatment as well. But usually it's going to be your heparin or your um, Xarelto. The patient is probably going to be on some level of bed rest, um, not necessarily strict bed rest, um, but maybe strict bed rest, but usually some kind of decreased activity. Um, you want to make sure you don't do anything that could break off that clot, like massages, for example, or using the SCDs. If you use the SCDs, SCDs are great for prevention, but if you use it once they have a clot, you can break that clot off. Um, and then making sure they're not putting, oops, sorry, throwing things at y'all, um, making sure that they don't have any pillows behind their knees because that can also impair blood flow. All right. Release of oxytocin during breastfeeding causes what expected postpartum symptom to increase? After pain. Excellent. After pain. So that cramping that they get for two to three days after giving birth, it's totally normal for breastfeeding to increase this because of the release of oxytocin. It's nature's way of helping that uterus constrict. So other things that can contribute to after pains, one is a largely stretched uterus. So um, the bigger that uterus had to blow up, the harder it's going to be for it to constrict back down. So they're going to have increased cramping or after pains. Another thing, the more babies they've had. It's just like when you blow up a balloon. The more times you blow up a balloon, the less stretchy it becomes, and it's harder for it to maintain back to its original size. So um, multiple babies, um, multiple pregnancies, I should say, multiple births, um, your largely stretched uterus, um, as well as breastfeeding, all increase the after pains. Parameters that nurses should teach the postpartum patient to seek health care for. What are some, some things you might tell them to seek health care for? If the uh, lochia, I guess, goes back to the, like, the previous color. You got it. Like, that is right. If they are having pink lochia, the lochia serosa, and then all of a sudden it goes back to the lochia rubra, that's a problem. If the lochia is malodorous, um, if there's a bad odor, that can indicate infection. If they continue to have cramping more than three days, that could be a sign of placental frag retained placental fragments. Fever, breast pain, calf pain, difficulty breathing, abnormal findings with the RETA assessment. All of these could be signs of infection, um, blood clots, or retained placental fragments. So all of these should be alerted to the healthcare provider. The defining parameter separating postpartum blues from postpartum depression is what? Time. Time. What is the time difference? Ten days. Ten days. Very good. So the difference in postpartum blues. 
flus and postpartum depression is 10 days. This, the symptoms are very similar. Um, postpartum blues is normal. It's due to hormonal changes. But if it's truly just postpartum blues, it should dissipate within 10 days after birth. Postpartum depression will last longer, and that is more concerning and usually will require some kind of treatment, whether it be counseling or medication. Um, our third category that we talked about was postpartum psychosis. And postpartum psychosis is where you most highly worry about suicidal and homicidal ideations. The primary nursing intervention in a postpartum patient that has heavy vaginal bleeding, they just have heavy bleeding, what's the first thing you're going to do? Assess the pad to see. Mm -hmm. Massage the fundus. Massage, Massage the fundus. This is distress. There's no assessment. Remember, assess and lessen distress. Your patient is bleeding. They are in distress. you got to do something about it. So fundal massage. This will hopefully alleviate your problem. Cough, difficulty breathing, low-grade fever, hypoxia, and petechia on the chest. What all may these be symptoms of? Should pulmonary embolism? You got it. Pulmonary embolism. So uh, pulmonary embolism is not always obvious. Sometimes the symptoms can be a little vague, uh, like cough, for example. They may just have a dry cough, may have a low-grade fever, petechia on the chest. All of these are potential symptoms of pulmonary embolism. Transparent skin with heavy vernix, highly visible veins, heavy presence of lanugo, floppy ears, minimal sole creases. What general gestational age do you think of? Preterm, term, or post-term? Pre These are all characteristics of your preterm baby. Um, so that transparent skin, the visible veins, those are big ones. Their skin is extremely thin and very friable, easy to tear. Um, heavy vernix, that vernix starts to decrease as they get older. Um, heavy lanugo, um, they look kind of furry when they're preterm sometimes um, because that lanugo hasn't fallen off. Great job. The only parameter that would contraindicate continuing to breastfeed on the affected breast if you have mastitis. Abscess. Excellent. Abscess formation. So if there is no abscess, um, they can continue to and are encouraged to continue to breastfeed on the affected side, even um, if they cannot breastfeed, whether it be because of abscess or whether it be because of um, it's too painful, then they should at least be pumping because they're going to make the problem worse. They're going to get a clogged milk duct, which is going to be even worse. So they should continue to breastfeed on both sides, including the affected side, um, unless there's an abscess. The optimal time after birth to obtain the newborn screening test. When's the best time? 24 hours. At least more than 24 hours. So two to three days is ideal. But let's be honest, babies usually aren't in the hospital that long. Um, by then, they've probably gone home. But at least 24 hours after birth. And the reason for this is they need to ingest food and break it down. Um, PKU is one of them. Um, your galactosemia is another one. Maple syrup, urine disease. These are all diseases that are um, a inborn metabolism problem with a certain either amino acid or like galactosemia has to do with milk sugars uh, where they're not breaking it down and when they don't break those down they create byproducts that go to the brain and cause permanent neurological disabilities um, and the that's why we need to screen for these to hopefully catch them early and then they won't develop these problems. So if, if you do it right after birth, the newborn screening test, and they have not processed any protein to where they would have developed these byproducts, the test is not going to be accurate because that's what it's looking for. So at least 24 hours. 
After briefly assessing ABCs, the priority nursing intervention of the imme infant immediately after birth is to do what? Dry them off. Dry them off. So the first thing we need to do is dry them off. Why? If we don't dry them off, what can they get? Hypothermia? <laughs> yes. Cold stress, hypothermia. We don't want the heat loss. Cold stress can cause what two things? Hypoglycemia. Respiratory distress. Very good. Hypoglycemia and respiratory distress. Y'all are killing it. Good job. So hype, um, hypothermia is not just about loss of temp. It can cause some more specific physical problems as well. So we want to make sure we're keeping babies warm, not just for comfort. This medication is given immediately after birth to the infant to prevent neonatal conjunctivitis. Erythromycin. Excellent. Ophthalmic erythromycin. It's a gel that we put in baby's eyes. We give it to every baby. And this is in case they mom had chlamydia or gonorrhea, which, as we've talked about before, both of those diseases are often asymptomatic. And if mom had chlamydia or gonorrhea, if baby passes through the birth canal, they can pick that up and get a eye infection, which can lead to blindness. So this will hopefully prevent them from getting neonatal conjunctivitis and therefore neonatal blindness. The normal expectation or a normal expectation in the head of a newborn related to passing through the birth canal. They look like cone head sometimes and it goes back to normal. What's that called? Normal. What's that? All the stuff that's normal. This is normal. Cephalohematomas and caputs are not normal. Normal findings is molding. So when they go through the birth canal, especially preterm babies, we call them toaster heads um, because their head really just goes into a peak because their sutures are so soft or their bones are so soft and their sutures are, are um, separated. It goes back to normal. It, it forms back out. And this is specifically vaginal birth babies um, because of passing through the birth canal. So the other ones we talked about, which one is the collection of fluid under the scalp that crosses the suture lines? Which one? The hematoma? No. What? I can't pronounce it. It's stadium. So when you think of, the, so this one crosses the suture lines. It's more spread out, right? Think of a cap, like cap it. Think of cap. So a cap sits on your whole head. It doesn't just sit on a piece of your head. So think of cap it as cap. So it sits across your head. It spreads out, crosses suture lines. The one that doesn't cross suture lines, it's more localized, is your cephalohematoma, that blood collection under the scalp. Which body system is affected in the infant with untreated high bilirubin levels? It's not the liver. The cardiovascular system? Brain. Brain. Very good. The brain. So bilirubin comes from our liver, but when we have high untreated bilirubin levels, those that bilirubin that's been unbroken down and unprocessed sits on the brain tissue, and it breaks down brain tissue. So they get permanent neurological problems, which is called kernicterus. So kernicterus is where they'll have permanent neurological disability because of high bilirubin levels. And Ms. Martinez, that's the one that you're talking about that's before the 24 hours. If the bilirubin is usually like we're at birth, a few they, hours, correct? They can get chronicterous with either one. It's just oh, having okay. those high bilirubin levels that go untreated. So if they stay high and they let them stay high and they don't come back down on their own, it can cause um, chronicterous. Increasing IV fluids and turning the mom on her side help combat what complication of anesthesia? Low blood pressure. I'll say, y'all better know that one. 
Hypotension, very good, low blood pressure. So we can turn her on her side, increase her fluids, and hopefully that will bump up her blood pressure. Which side's better, do y'all remember? Left lateral. Yes, Left. very good. Left is best. Priority nursing intervention for an infant with acrocyanosis. What are we gonna do if they have acrocyanosis? Panic? Nothing, it's if it's in the extremity. Well, we gotta do something. No, what you document. What's that? Warm them up. Warm them up. We mm -hmm. don't wanna just leave them that way because that means they're cold. But we do have to do something, but it's not a hypoxia issue. It is a circulation issue. So we need to warm them up. These are the nursing care parameters of an infant with spina bifida cystica who has not had surgery, also known as a meningocele or myelomeningocele. So what positioning do they need to be in? Prone. Prone. They need to be prone. Um, what do we want to put over the sac? Isn't it a sterile oh, yeah, warm, moist, sterile gauze, because we want to keep that sac from drying out, because if it dries out, it's going to crack. If it cracks, it's no longer protect protecting that spinal cord. So prone positioning, keep the sac warm and moist with um, sterile gauze, strict infection control measures. These babies are going to be in, in isolettes, definitely, and monitoring for signs of infection as well, the things we talked about like temperature instability. Um, we the um, poor feeding, um, either lethargy or irritability, things like that. What is the cause of retinopathy of prematurity? High oxygen. Very good. Giving too much oxygen. How can we prevent it? Monitor the flow in the O2. Yeah, exactly. Monitoring their O2 saturations um, and decreasing it whenever we can. So instead of just giving them oxygen, um, giving them only what they need. Um, and that can prevent some of that uh, vasoconstriction that results in decreased blood flow to the eyes. All right, the best way to most accurately determine that an infant belongs to a specific mother. What do they do when they take baby in the room? What do they do? Check the armband. What are they checking on the armband? If you haven't had a baby, you might not know this one. So they're going to check. There's a security number that they check. So the best way to do it is not just to say, hey, are you Joe Schmo? Is this your baby? It's to say, hey, read your number on your armband, mom. And then the nurse is looking at the armband on baby and comparing the numbers. They'll have the same security number, the same ID number, and comparing those two numbers to make sure they match is ideally the way it should be done. Which reflex is known as the startle reflex? Mono. 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 Very Morrow. good. The Morrow reflex, also known as the startle. When you make a noise, they fan their arms out. The reflex where the toes fan when the foot is stroked. Y'all usually know that one pretty well. Babinski. So the reflex where the baby turns the head when the cheek is stroked. What's that called? Rooting. Rooting, very good, rooting. The other one, one that's not on here is your tonic neck, or you'll hear it called fencing, where when you turn baby's head, they straighten that arm out the same direction and bend the other one. Hey, wait a minute. I didn't mean to do that. Shoot, which one was I on? We did that one. Ha ha, there we go. Fever, cramping, and increased lochia or malodorous lochia may indicate what postpartum infection? What is the actual name? Is it endometritis? You got it. Endometritis, which is a uterine infection. So all these symptoms may point to she has an infection of the uterus. That is a problem. 
the best methods to increase breast comfort in a mom who's bottle feeding. One, tell them to wear what? Fitted bra. Yes. Tell them to wear a good bra. What else? Good ice pack. Ice packs, very good. Decreasing stimulation. So wearing a good fitting bra, limiting breast stimulation, using ice packs, cold cabbage, things like that. Those can all help improve um, mama's comfort. Ooh, will this show me comments? Huh. I'm just curious, what are y'all seeing right now? Y'all still seeing the PowerPoint? No, a black screen. Ah, I was wondering if it would take me back to the um, what you call it, and y'all would still be able to see the PowerPoint. These are the normal vital sign parameters on a newborn. So, what's the normal heart rate? Hundred and ten to one hundred and sixty. Beautiful. What's the normal respiratory rate? 30 to 60. 30 to 60. Anybody know the normal blood pressure? It's like 40 to 60 in the diastolic. And the other one 60 to 80 in the systolic. Very good. So 60 to 80 over 40 to 50. That's awesome. Um, so I will tell you, we don't really focus on blood pressures too much in, in babies. Usually under the age of three, unless they have some kind of underlying condition where we are worried about their blood pressure, we don't really care about blood pressures too much. Heart rate and respiratory rate are the two big ones. Um, you should focus on because they're going to be the ones that are different um, than an adult. Remember, with our respiratory rate, it's going to be irregular. They're not going to breathe on a regular rate like we do um, because their body is learning how to breathe. So 30 to 60 and irregular. The temp is important, but the reason I don't point out the temp or the oxygen saturations is those aren't really different than the adults. The temp is a hair higher than an adult's, but not significantly higher. The most objective way to determine what is going on with a patient, what type of data will give us the most objective information? Assessing. Vitals. Vitals is a good example. So something with numbers, vital signs, urine output, intake, any, the, the more objective it is, the better your assessment data is going to be. So when you can include things with numbers instead of something vague like appears anxious, um, that you're better off. So the more objective you can be, the better. So let's see if you know your conversions and your weight-based dosing. An infant who weighs 4,800 grams is ordered to receive 10 to 15 milligrams per kilogram per dose of acetaminophen. What is the minimum dose the patient should receive in micrograms? I'm going to give you all a couple minutes so you can work it out. And then I'll see what you got. I'll give you the first part, converting your weight, 4,800 grams, because we always do newborn weights in grams, converting it to kilograms, we're giving 48 milligrams when we multiply by the minimum dose, which is 10 milligrams. But our question isn't asking for milligrams, it's asking for micrograms. So we're going to take that 48 milligrams and multiply by 1,000 micrograms, because there's 1,000 micrograms in a milligram. So your answer would be 48,000 micrograms. Make sure you know your conversions. I got that right. Yay! I love it. I want to hope y'all get this one right, because that's old news.
Alrighty. Let me pull up the other one. Ah! Where's it doing? Alright. Let's see if it comes up this way, and if it doesn't, I'll close it and reopen it, like I did the, with the first one. What do y'all see? Do y'all see the full screen initial board? It's loading. Okay. I can see it now. Yay! Perfect. Beautiful. All right. Let's get started. Let's start with some nutrition because I know that's everybody's fave. So avoidance of phenylalanine and using low phenylac formula are important dietary needs for a patient with what metabolic disorder? PKU. Yes. Phenylketonuria or PKU. So they must avoid phenylalanine, which is found in high protein products like meats. Um, it's also found in diet sodas, um, which is why you'll see that on the side of diet sodas. So they must avoid this amino acid because if they break it down, they form byproducts against it, and it builds up on their brain, causing permanent neurological complications. Um, the substitute that they use instead of those higher protein products is low phenylac. That's a formula specifically low protein made for these patients. Teaching parameters for breastfeeding. Give me some ideas. Always switch right sides. The... Stop at the side that you started. Yes. Switching sides. How long is the minimum they should feed on each side? 15 to 20 minutes 10 on to each 15. side. 10 to 15. Yeah. 10 to 15. Making sure they're switching sides every two to three hours. No free water, absolutely important. Children under age six months, and we'll talk about this again when we go to pediatrics, no free water in children under the age of six months because they cannot concentrate their urine the same way we do, and it will dilute their electrolytes, and they can have seizures from the low sodium levels. Making sure that when baby latches, they're latching appropriately, that they are opening their mouth wide enough to take in the all of the nipple and most of the alveoli. And also when mom is removing baby from the breast, you don't just pop baby off the nipple because that suction will cause nipple damage. They should take their pinky, put it in between to the in the crack of baby's mouth to break that suction before removing baby off the nipple so they don't cause um, nipple damage. This may be found in the newborn when the mother has maternal nipple damage. What characteristic in baby's mouth might you find? Thrush. Nope. A tissue characteristic. I feel like, I feel like it has to do like with their, their sucking. Like is it the, 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 the frenulum? Exactly, the tight frenulum, or you'll hear it called being tongue-tied in layperson's terms. So when they have that tight frenulum, that, that piece under there um, that attaches your tongue to the base of the mouth, um, if it's too large or too tight, it doesn't allow baby to open their mouth wide enough to take in enough of the breast tissue to adequately feed. Easy to fix. They can just clip it with some sterile scissors, um, but if it's left undone, they're not going to be able to feed appropriately, and it can contribute to mastitis because it will cause nipple damage. These are the methods to determine adequate breast milk intake in the newborn. What are some things, some characteristics we'll see that will help us know that they are eating adequately? Six to eight wet diapers a day. 
That is the biggest one. Yes. So if they're, if they're well hydrated, then they're getting enough intake because that's the only thing they should be getting is breast milk or formula. So the number of wet diapers, six to eight per day. If you can hear audible swallowing while they're eating, that's a sign that they are t getting um, breast milk. Um, if the breasts feel softer after a feeding, then that's an indication those breasts are being emptied. If the infant is more relaxed or sleeping after a feeding, that indicates they got a full belly. Um, and if they are able to feed for 10 to 15 minutes a session, um, generally that is an indication that they are um, getting an adequate amount. But the number of wet diapers is the best way we teach parents to um, know that they are feeding enough. Expected additional calorie intake for a lactating mother is how many extra calories a day? 500. 500. Very good. So it's not an entire other meal, although when you're breastfeeding, it feels like it. An entire another um, person that you're feeding, but it feels like it. So about a good size additional meal. How much extra fluid? It's three liters liter. total, right? Yeah, so about three liters total, so we tell them about an extra liter a day than you would normally. So eight to ten cups or one liter a day. Very good. Because newborns cannot shiver to regulate body temperature, if you see shivering or jitters, what are you going to think that may be going on instead? Hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia. Excellent. Hypoglycemia. So if you ever see shivering or sweating in a newborn, something is wrong. They cannot do either one of those to regulate their temperature. Um, so if they're shivering, that could indicate it's probably not shivering. It's actually jitters. Could be hypoglycemia. So what is the minimum blood glucose in a term, baby? 40, I believe. 45. How about preterm? 35. 35. Very good. So it's pretty low. Um, those, those numbers, when you first see them, not thinking about how much lower babies can be, can be a little jolting um, when you're used to seeing, you know, 90s in an adult. 90s in a normal adult, not a lot of our adults at three or 400. Let's see the other one. So another thing that can cause shivers or jitters or tremors, sneezing, yawning, increased irritability, diarrhea, anorexia, diaphoresis. These may be all related to what complication? Withdrawal. Yeah, so the neonatal abstinence or the withdrawal situation. All these are symptoms that can be associated with that. These would be danger signs in a newborn that the parents should be taught, if seen, to contact their provider. What are some things that would be abnormal in a newborn? That would be a lot. Irregular breathing? Yeah. Irregular breathing is okay. Sweating. Well, the, the, okay. the, the substernal retractions. Yes, if they had retractions, very good. So if they had signs of respiratory distress like retractions or grunting, that would be concerning. Um, if they had any signs of infection, for example, temperature instability. With infants are very similar to old people <laughs> in the sense of that they don't get necessarily a fever when they have an infection. Um, they are more likely to actually drop their temperature or have just temperature instability going back and forth. So with elderly people, it's because their hypothalamus is wearing out. With newborns, it's because they have a new hypothalamus that has figured out something's wrong, but I'm not exactly sure how to respond yet, so I'm just going to go all over the place until I figure it out. So their temperature could be high, low, or just going back and forth, unstable as a sign of infection. If they refuse to feed for more than an hour or if they are vomiting, um, if they have irritability or lethargy, um, they should be at least evaluated. Um, a lot of times if they have an infection, irritability will start first, um, and then they'll develop lethargy. So they can go from one to the other as the infection progresses. 
All right. Asymmetrical gluteal folds, limited leg abduction, one leg shorter than the other. These are all signs of what newborn problem? Hip dysplasia. You got it. Hip dysplasia, another thing that you would see is that or Barlow and Ortolani test. So with the Barlow test, they're trying to pop um, the hips out of joint. Um, and then when they do the Ortolani next, they're trying to feel for a click where it's popping back into joint. So if they dislocated it with the Barlow test, then they're going to feel that click when they go to pop it back in with the Ortolani test, which is a positive sign of hip dysplasia as well. So what's the treatment? It is. Do y'all remember the name of it? Uh, yeah, um, wait, the name? <laughs> that one is the Pavlik harness. So it, it makes them sit where their legs are, are pulled up like a frog, um, and it, it deepens that uh, pocket that the acetabulum fits in so that it will um, not dislocate. All right, this complication occurs due to inadequate reabsorption of cerebrospinal fluid into the ventricles. What is it called? Anybody know this one? This is one we'll talk about again in pediatrics. Spinal bifida? No. Hydrocephalus. So oh. hydrocephalus, yes, literally translates to waterhead. Water, so, yeah. Yep. So you'll see this on babies. Um, it's common with patients that have cerebral palsy, for example, seizure disorders, or sometimes it can just be isolated by itself. There's something going on in the brain that is causing the ventricles not be, to be able to reabsorb that CSF the way it's supposed to. So usually these patients have to get what's called a VP shunt or a ventriculoperitoneal shunt, and it's a shunt that it literally snakes under their skin. Um, if they're thin, you can see the line under their neck as it goes down and it, it empties out into their peritoneal cavity um, to allow that fluid to drain. This is the best method to decrease perennial swelling in a new postpartum patient. I know y'all know this one. Ice. 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 After 24 hours, what can we use? Six <laughs> Sits pass. Very good. Sits pass. So we don't want to use sits pass less than 24 hours after. For one, it increases risk of infection if they have an uh, open wound, especially if they have a, an episiotomy. Um, but it also, when you have heat, it pulls edema to the site. So you can make edema worse if you're using heat in that first 24 hours. These are what the newborn screening tests are testing for. What are some of the diseases that are tested on the newborn screening test? There's the hearing test. Are you talking like specific tests? No, or? The newborn screening test. There's, there's a newborn screening test that's a blood test. Is PKU one of them? PKU is one of them. And maple syrup something. You got it. Maple syrup, urine disease. Oh, there's also the, the sickle cell disease. Yes, sickle cell. Very good. So some of them, um, so the diseases that fall under the newborn genetic screening test are genetic defects and metabolic disorders. So some examples, and it varies a little bit from state to state, but pretty much all states, they are 20 to 22 diseases. Um, there are things like sickle cell anemia, cystic fibrosis, PKU, congenital hypothyroidism, maple syrup, urine disease, galactosemia. Those are just some of the examples that we see um, that are, are tested. This describes, whoops, a normal postpartum finding related to urination. What is normal postpartum? What are they going to do? Is it stress? 
Polyuria? Polyuria. Oops, yes. Come on. There we go. Oh, my bud didn't want to work. Polyuria or diuresis. They are going to pee a lot. And that is fine as long as that's all they're doing. Now, if they also had this symptom, that would be abnormal. What would that be? Dysuria. Dysuria. Very good. So polyuria by itself or diuresis um, is fine. Um, it's expected in the first day or two. Um, but di uh, dysuria is not okay. Swaddling, rocking, using a pacifier, creating a quiet environment. These are all non-pharmacological methods of pain relief in infants. So these are ways that we can calm infants. Um, you'll see these used a lot, especially like with circumcision, for example. They'll use the Sweeties, which it's this little um, plastic container with the peel-off lid. It's just a sucrose solution. You can dip the pacifier in it and have them suck on it. Um, the sweetness of it uh, combined with the non-nutritive sucking of the pacifier helps with pain relief. These would be important to monitor as abnormal signs in the preterm infant. So what are some things we would be worried about? Apnea that lasts more than 20 seconds. Yes, absolutely. So it prolonged apnea, especially in preterm babies, they are more likely to have that prolonged apnea. There have been many times I've had babies where I'm sitting there watching them like, come on. Come on, all right, all right, come on, come on. <laughs> and you want them to, and you finally like, screw it, I need to stimulate you because I can't wait any longer. Um, and sometimes they just need it, they're like, hey, and, and they they startle and then they breathe again. So um, it's easy for preterm babies to forget to breathe. Um, some of the other ones that you see, skin color changes, such as pallor, cyanosis, if they have vomiting, bulging fontanelles, that can be a sign of hydrocephalus. The fontanelle is that area, the soft spot, you'll hear people call it, um, and that is where the sutures have not come together yet. If it's bulging instead of flat, that indicates some kind of pressure buildup in the head. Lethargic, irritability, if they have those um, temperature instability issues, all those things, excellent. Normal uterine involution. So we talked about this a little bit. So at birth, um, right when she has birth, you expect the fundus to be midline, right at the umbilicus, and firm. How much does it descend by? One centimeter per day. Yep, about a centimeter every 12 to 24 hours. At what point is it non-palpable? Like you can't feel it anymore. After the tenth day postpartum, yeah, about about two weeks at the most. So usually about ten weeks to ten weeks. Sorry, ten days to two weeks. Um, you you should not be able to feel it anymore. Excellent. The most important assessment in an infant with macrosomia is to test what. Glucose. glucose. Very good. Blood glucose. Patients with macrosomia are your priority patients. Even if they are stable now, that doesn't mean they're going to be stable in 30 minutes. They are your priority patients because they have the biggest risk of becoming unstable quickly. This is a good therapeutic communication technique for a patient who had an unexpected outcome. What can you do? Silence. Silence is excellent. Just presence, being with somebody, holding their hand, just sitting with them is incredibly therapeutic. Um, also, uh, acknowledging their feelings. So uh, it looks like you're upset. Would you like to talk about it? Things like that. Um, offering help. Um, can I call the chaplain for you? Is there anybody I can call for you? Can I get you something? Um, those two are fantastic for therapeutic communication in general. Acknowledging the patient of what they're feeling and offering help. But silence, we actually had a great conversation in day, the day class today about how important silence is in therapeutic communication. It absolutely is. Just presence. 
This is considered normal newborn weight loss. Up to what percent? 10%. 10. It's a 10. Sorry. Varsity Blues. Five to, I'm not going to say the rest of it. But 5 to 10%. So when should the no newborn return to birth weight? By what time? Two weeks. Yes. Two weeks maximum is when they should be at least at their birth weight, if not surpassed their birth weight. Very good. These are considered normal newborn alterations regarding the reproductive system. So what are one or what are two things female babies have that are normal? Do I remember that one? One has to do with vaginal discharge. What are you going to see in a newborn baby that's normal with vaginal discharge? That's well, we have the protozoal menstruation. Yes, pseudo menstruation. Very good. So they can have bloody vaginal discharge or pink tinge vaginal discharge, either one. And those are both normal. They call it pseudo menstruation. And it has to do with uh, the, the influence of the mom's hormones being in utero. Um, the other one has to do with nipple discharge. What kind of nipple discharge might they have? Like Yes. White nipple discharge, you'll hear it called, lay people will call it witch's milk. Um, and it's, again, normal. It has to do with mom's hormonal influences affecting baby. So bloody or pink tinge vaginal discharge, white nipple discharge, both normal, not concerning. Go away in a few days, just has to do with mom's hormonal levels or mom's hormonal influence, I should say. So this is, let's see if y'all know this one. This is the method for determining an infant's adjusted developmental age for infants who were born preterm. How would we do that when we're doing, when we're determining development? Fundal height? Fundal mm -hmm. score? Mm-mm. Amniocentesis? Apgar? No, so what we do, and this is for infants, not just for newborns, and we'll talk about this again with pediatrics. When we're assessing their, and I know we haven't talked about this, so I wouldn't necessarily expect y'all to know that unless you actually had a preterm baby, you might, um, or you might not. Um, so babies, when they're preterm, we don't judge them based on what their actual chronological age is. We judge them on their development based on where they should be. So for example, if they were born at say 36 weeks, that puts them about a month early, right? So if they were born at 36 weeks and they're two months old, we're not going to look at their growth and development of a two-month-old. We're going to judge them as a one-month-old because if they had been born on time, that's how old they would have been up till the age of two. Through the age of two, we do this adjusted developmental age. Um, once they hit two, just based on development alone, they would have caught up to that. These are the two best methods for determining patient understanding. Fundamentals, go. Teach back. Teach back. What's the other one? Demonstrate. Return demonstration. Yes. Teach back, return demonstration. Very, very good. Y'all, I was going to say, y'all better know this one by now. The primary nursing intervention in an infant with apnea, let's say they stop breathing for a little longer than you like, what can you do? Stimulate them. Stimulate them. Very good. That's exactly what you do. Um, a lot of times we'll start out with like rubbing the bottom of their feet or tapping the bottom of their feet to see if that um, irritates them. We'll say, hey, wake up. <laughs> and and they'll, they'll kind of startle and, and go about breathing their normal route. Um, we don't spank them on their butt like you see in the old movies. That is not an intervention we do, but we stimulate them in some way. This is the primary nursing intervention with IV infusion complications. If your IV infusion starts having complications, you're going to do first. Stop it. 
the infusion. Stop the infusion. Very good. So the first thing you're going to do um, if there are complications is you're going to stop the infusion. You need to take away the problem before you fix anything else or assess anything else. Symptoms of respiratory distress in an infant are what? Accessory muscle use. Yes, that's an excellent one. Cyanosis. What's that? Nasal flaring. Cyanosis. Echomosis. Is that what you said? I was trying to say cyanosis. Oh, cyanosis. I got you. Yes, cyanosis definitely can be one. That's a bad one. That's a late sign. Um, so, like, the accessory muscle use is great, like retractions. Grunting is a sign. Nasal flaring is another one. Um, to kidney, if they're just breathing fast, that can be a sign of respiratory distress as well. Awesome job, guys. All right, yes, okay. last math. Let's see if you know this one. My day class should know this because we went over this. Let's see how the night class does. So you have a newborn that's weighed at 3,752 grams at birth. At three days after birth, the infant is weighed again at 3,497 grams. Based on that, determine the percentage of weight loss. And I'm going to give you all a second to work through it before I give you the answer. This is a ratio question. So for those of you in the evening and you're like, what in the world is she talking about? Think of a ratio. Maybe. Are we rounding to the nearest 10? Yeah, round to the nearest 10. Sorry. I got 6.8 as well. Same here. All right. So for those of you that aren't sure how to solve this, let's go through this. So we start with our birth weight. So our birth weight is at 3,752 grams. And then we need to subtract whatever our second weight was to figure out just how many grams they lost. So this baby lost 255 grams. So to figure out the ratio of that, we take what they lost, which is 255 grams, divided by what their starting weight was, in this case, their birth weight. So when we do that, we get a percentage, I mean, we get a decimal, which is going to be 0 0.068. In order to convert a decimal to a percentage, you then multiply by 100%. And that converts it to, like y'all said, 6.8%. Excellent job. Is this normal? Are we good with 6.8%? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Go. We're good. Excellent job. Let me see if I can get out of here. There we go. Good job, guys. I'm proud of y'all. Y'all are going to do fantastic, right? Yeah. Yes. Woo. I believe so. I believe in you. So what questions can I answer for y'all? Ah, where'd my cursor go? Okay, that's weird. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I remember there was like a tri titration something. Sorry, I don't say that. Yeah. Uh, the titration of like medication. Uh huh. Like in the last exam, do you have like any resources you can recommend to like pass this one? Yep, yeah, in in the math folder on the in the class. My cursor's oh. act up. Hold on, if I can get my. Uh. Um, in the math order on Blackboard, in the introductory documents, there is um, a PowerPoint and there are some practice questions. There we go. Maybe I can get it to hold on. Two, two. Oh, okay. I saw those, but I didn't know that those were there. Yep. So hold on. Is it in math or did I put it in week three? <laughs> now, now you got me questioning myself. It's in math. Okay, yeah, it is in math. math. Perfect. Yep, so that's where you can find those um, for the titrations. And that's the, the biggest time we focus on those is for um, 
uh, for labor and delivery. So we're not really doing labor and delivery for this test, so I wouldn't worry about it too badly. My cursor's acting crazy. What questions can I answer for y'all? There we go. Fix my cursor. <laughs> Can you please um, go over the uh, tetralogy I'll follow? Yeah, absolutely. So I will tell you, we won't really focus on tetralogy of Fallot too much until we get to pediatric cardiac disorders. Um, tetralogy of Fallot, I'm trying to find my thingy. That's right, this one doesn't have it. So with tetralogy of Fallot, it's four disorders. And what is going on? Let me pull a notepad. It's a good one. Where are you? Um. Okay, I don't see my notepad. That's the weirdest thing. Ah, paint. That's what I'm looking for. All right. Share my desktop. Make it easier. All righty. So with Tetralogy of Fallot, this is your heart, and yes, I realize this is not anatomically correct. So if this is right atria, right ventricle, left atria, and it, that's why it's called tetralogy is because it's four disorders um, that go along with it. And let's say these are the lungs in between. So the first thing you have is what's called a VSD. So with a VSD, it's where there's a hole. So typically there should be a wall here separating the two ventricles. But when you have a VSD, there's not. There's an opening, which means blood can flow back and forth. Which if you just have a VSD by itself, not a big deal. The blood just gets recirculated back through the heart. And it, it does put more strain on the heart, especially if it's a big VSD, um, but overall not so bad. But what makes this VSD bad is you also have something called an overriding aorta. I'll just write over aorta, but it's overriding aorta. And instead of the aorta coming out over here, like it's supposed to, like you have your aorta coming out here, systemic going to the body, you have an aorta that's coming out overriding that VSD. So because of this, it's pulling blood not only from this left ventricle, but also from this right ventricle as well. Blood in the right ventricle hasn't been oxygenated yet. So that's where a lot of the VSD hypooxygenation issues come from, is it's pulling blood from this right ventricle that hasn't gone through the lungs yet. A couple other problems that you have. You have pulmonary stenosis.
which means this uh, this pulmonary artery that's going up to the heart normally it's open but it's it's stenosed meaning it's narrowed so this is putting extra pressure causing path of least resistance to push further push this blood out into the world unoxygenated on top of this because of that stenosis you get a right ventricular hypertrophy so if you remember back from med surge when you talked about hypertension for example and how it causes um, hypertrophy of the muscles of the heart which leads to congestive heart failure so because this muscle in the right ventricle is working so hard to try and get blood to where it needs to go it gets thickened it gets hypertrophied which means it can't fill up as much so the four of these together um, results in typically these babies at rest are fine but then when they have an activity that causes increased cardiac demand like crying feeding things like that the, the it's going to pull that extra blood flow needed from the path of least resistance which is going to be from that right ventricle causing them to have what we call tet spells where they turn blue did any of that make sense <laughs> yes thank you perfect and, and that is something we won't really focus on for newborn, but we will for pediatrics. You will definitely need to understand the mechanisms of what's going on with um, Tetralogy of Fallot. So it's never too early to, to learn about that one. And I know the book talks about some of the, the, the maternity book talks about some of those cardiac defects as well. What other questions do y'all have for me? Y'all know it all, right? We're ready to get right out. Maybe. Not yet. Are y'all madly flipping through your notes right now trying to figure out what you need to ask? I'm sure that's what it is. So, uh, nipple feeding uh, on a baby with, um, crap, uh, what is it, spina bifida? Ah! Never mind, sorry. No, you're fine. They can totally still bottle feed. Um, you just have to turn their head to the side. So they have to be in a prone positioning. You can't put them supine, uh, but you can turn them to the side and they can still nipple feed. Turn their head to the side, not the body to the side. I, let, me, let me be more specific on that one.
Now, I will tell you, I know newborn can kind of seem like it's pretty simple and pretty easy. Um, there's a lot of information in newborn, so make sure y'all are reviewing newborn especially. I mean, postpartum is just as important. It's 50%, but there's a lot of details in newborn. But don't take postpartum for granted. The answer is not always turn her on or, or not always massage the fundus. Turn her on her side, prepare for IV. <laughs> That's some of them. Give her some ice. Y'all got any questions? Thought of anything? Notes. Yeah. And, uh, I've got newborn withdrawal scale. I don't know what that is. Oh, for the neonatal withdrawal? Yeah. So you don't necessarily have to, let me pull up one. Um, you don't have to memorize the parameters of one. It's a tool that we use um, in the hospital to really objectively give an idea to us if they're improving or declining on their withdrawal status. So let me see if I can find an example. Um, there's a little bit of difference. Um, the one we actually use for neonates is slightly different than the one we use for older children, but it has very similar um, characteristics that we're looking at. Um, so we're looking at things like how much they're yawning, how much they're sneezing, if they're having diarrhea, sweating, tremors. Um, it, it's really a, a cumulative um, assessment of their, their characteristics and how they're doing. I was hoping I could find an example. Um, and it's something we usually chart every few hours in the hospital. Um, depending on how they're doing, we'll determine how often. Minimum every eight hours, but sometimes every four. This is one. Here's a good one. 
see if I can share this with y'all. Um, and it, it's really just a way for us to see over time um, how they're doing. Um, if they're getting better, if they're getting worse. Where did the picture go? Stop being silly. You know what I'll do? I'm just going to share my desktop. That way it'll come up. All right. So let's see if I can make this better. Open a new window, or is it going to open the whole? Thing. This was as part of a study. I have to pull up that picture. Major drugs. It's probably further down then. Let's show me. Here we go. Oh, there, ha, ha. Okay, so when we're doing the neonatal abstinence scoring system, they'll do this again um, every, um, sometimes even every two hours, um, depend, especially if it's more severe. So they'll look at, for instance, continuous high-pitched cry, um, if they are, how long they're sleeping, um, if they're hyperactive. So babies that have um, neonatal abstinence are very irritable and just, Hyperactive, so if that Moro reflex is just re over, over excessive, and you see how each characteristic it has a score next to it. So, for instance, if they're sleeping less than an hour after a feeding, they would get a score of three in this category. So, you do it for each category, you give them a score, and then you get to the end and you get a total score where you add up all the numbers in the column. So, for instance, if you had a score of say six here, and then two hours later you did it again and you had a score of seven. Ooh, that's going up. That's not a good thing. Or if it's stay, staying stable, or maybe you see, oh, it went down to four. That's a good thing. Um, you can see that trend more objectively on a number basis than just saying, oh, it looks like they're getting better. It just gives you a more objective way of assessing um, how they're doing through that withdrawal system, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Perfect. And I don't want y'all to memorize the different. Now, you do need to know the symptoms of neonatal withdrawal, but not necessarily memorizing that this symptom gets a score of three and this one gets a score of one and, and things like that. But you should know what those symptoms are that we're assessing.
All right, guys, if y'all don't have any questions for me, I'm going to let y'all go. Please email me if you have any questions. Um, I will um, meet with y'all on Blackboard next week. Well, those of you in the evening class, I'll meet with you tonight. Um, but next week in your exam groups. You're welcome. Enjoy your weekend studying. Try and get some sunshine in between. I don't even know what the weather is supposed to be like, but... Good evening. I will see y'all tomorrow or next week.